The title of the message is, Will Everything You've Worked For Be Destroyed? Now, the Kent Online News Service on the 25th of September 2019 had this story. The owner of a workshop destroyed by a fire has described the heartbreaking moment he saw his whole business burnt to the ground. Craig Judge arrived at Kent Wardrobes in Kingswood to find fire crew tending the aftermath of a huge blaze. Mr. Judge, 33, said, When I got there, I saw the whole workshop burnt down to the ground. I started working on the place 10 years ago. It took this long to get it how I wanted, and it was all just gone. Mr. Judge, who lives in Kingswood and runs the company alongside wife Emma, added, I'm absolutely heartbroken. Everything I have ever worked for has been destroyed. There's not one screw left. Now, when I read that, I thought, first of all, that's sad, you know, that, that his business had, that he built up for 10 years has been completely burnt to the ground. But then I was thinking about that statement. He says, everything that I've ever worked for has been destroyed. And I'm gonna ask you this question as we begin. Could that possibly happen to you? That everything that you've ever worked for be destroyed? Now, Peter, in this passage that we're about to read, is going to say that everything material in this world is going to be burnt to a crisp. It's going to be completely dissolved and destroyed. So, live for God. Live for Him. Love Him. Everything that you do should be for God. Jesus, you remember, said this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, don't store up treasure here on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's talking about storing up treasure in heaven. You see, if God means everything to you, And if everything you do is to serve God, then you can't lose anything. You see, this world is going to burn up, but God and the works that you do for God are going to remain forever and ever and ever. It was C.T. Studd who said, one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's absolutely true. Those things that we do in our lifetimes for Christ in Christ's name, led by him, empowered by him, those things are going to last for eternity. And so we're either building on something that is just temporary and going to be burnt up, or we're going to be building on something that is eternal. This is really the heart of what Peter is getting at this morning in our passage. I want you to read with me um, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 16, and then we'll go through it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things hard to understand, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Now these next two verses we'll read, but we're not going to cover them today. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Those last two verses we'll cover next week because I really want to focus on them. 
But looking here at these six verses, 10 to 16, he begins by saying, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, you remember that last week we looked at verses 1 to 9, and Peter was saying that scoffers are going to come along laughing about God's judgment to come. They're going to say, where is this promise of his coming, the promise of future judgment? And he says, don't you remember that God once flooded the world? Well, he's going to do it again, but this time he's going to judge the world again, but through, through fire. But he's patiently waiting for people to get saved. Why isn't God coming back to judge the world now? He wants people to be saved and to go to heaven. That's why. So he says, the coming of the Lord, the, sorry, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now this phrase, the day of the Lord, is biblically speaking, any period when God acts in judgment. So you, you read about the day of the Lord 17 times in the Old Testament. You read about it from the prophet Isaiah through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel, through Daniel, on and on and on through the Old Testament prophets. They talk about the day of the Lord. It's a period, any period, when God acts in judgment. Let me give you a sample of that. Obadiah, just a, a short little book in the Old Testament. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 15. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. So the prophet is saying, this is what's going to happen. God's going to come and he's going to judge the nations. Now, when we get to the New Testament, this phrase, the day of the Lord, is a period of time over four stages. Now, let me explain that to you. A period of time over four different stages. First of all, it includes the Great Tribulation period. That is a period of time the Bible is, it calls a seven-year period in which God will pour out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. Chapters 6 through 19 of the book of Revelation speak of it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 speaks of that. So the great tribulation is included in the day of the Lord. Secondly, the second coming of Jesus Christ in bodily form to this earth is also included in the day of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 talks about he's coming back with fire and he's going to judge those who are unrighteous at that time and he's going to be saving Israel. The third aspect, the third stage of the day of the Lord is the millennial kingdom. Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 20, he stood up and said that um, there will be this time He's, he's quoting, actually, um, uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 31. But he says this, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. He's speaking of the millennial reign. And there's going to be this judgment upon the earth as Christ comes and he's going to rule and reign for 1,000 years. So then the fourth aspect of the day of the Lord is the final destruction of the heavens and the earth. And that's what's spoken of here. So we've got four aspects of the day of the Lord in the New Testament. The great tribulation, the second coming, the millennial kingdom of a thousand years, and then the final destruction of the heavens and the earth. And he says here that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Now, a thief in the night comes unexpectedly, but it's only for some. Jesus is going to come back. His, his appearing is going to be as a thief in the night for some. Now, this is what Paul writes about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, unexpectedly. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So he's saying it comes as a thief in the night, but not for believers, for unbelievers. They're not expecting it. They're scoffing at it. They say, no, where's the promise of his coming? It's not going to happen. 
But we as believers, we're not in the darkness. We're in the day. We see it coming. We know. So it's not going to take us as a thief. And then he says, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, 75 years ago this summer, on 16th of July, 1945, at 5.30 a.m., in the New Mexico desert, 60 miles south of Albuquerque, Scientists from the Manhattan Project, led by Robert Oppenheimer, detonated the first atomic bomb. And it was an implosion-type plutonium-239 bomb called the Gadget. And the force of this explosion was 20 kilotons of TNT. Now, I want you to compare that to that port of Beirut explosion that happened last week. That was not 0.3 to not 0.5 kilotons. It was a huge explosion. You've probably seen some videos of people driving along far, far away and their cars demolished as they're taking a video of this thing. That's a huge explosion. And yet this explosion was 20 kilotons compared to 0.3 to 0.5. It was detonated from a 100-foot tower, which was completely obliterated. The fireball was seen Um, on the mountaintop in Albuquerque, 60 miles away. And the, the sand, the intense heat, turned the sand into glass all around the site. Now you look at that and you go, wow, that is tremendous power. Now, scientists had been working on that for years, in fact, decades. And the first person to actually split the atom was a British subject named Ernest Rutherford. He did it in 1918 in Manchester. Um, He was from New Zealand, was living in Manchester, and and he split the atom. And he saw the potential of splitting the atom as a a source of power, which led to further research. 1938, Otto Hahn, Lisa Meitner, and Fritz Straussner found that when you fired a neutron At the nucleus of a uranium-235 atom, it split into barium-141 and krypton-92 with three neutrons um, left to go out and split further U-235 atoms, causing a chain reaction. And the result of this was a tremendous amount of power. So you could take one kilogram cubed of uranium-235 that's about 1.5 inches on each side. And and if you cause a chain reaction within that one kilogram cube, it would produce 20 kilotons of TNT, that kind of power. That was what they did for the first atomic bomb. And you think, man, just in that little bit, what kind of power is generated? Now, I mentioned last week that in the nucleus of an atom, you've got protons and neutrons compacted tightly together. And you know from your science classes that these protons are positively charged, and you know that like charges repel one another. So positive charge on a, on a magnet and another positive charge will repel one another. Well, scientists can't figure out why these things just hold together. And they call it the atomic glue or the strong Uh, atomic force, the strong nuclear force. Well, we know from Scripture, it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, that Christ is holding all things together by the word of his power. He holds it all together. He is that strong nuclear force. And you you look at the the inside of an atom and, and you see, yes, the protons and neutrons in there, in the nucleus, but then you see the electrons spinning around those things at, at such a rapid, rapid rate. Now, they're spinning so fast that, that it feels solid, like, like the chair you're sitting on. It's all made up of these things. But there's a tremendous amount of gap in between. Like if you were to blow up an atom to 10 miles diameter, the nucleus would be about the size of a football. Five miles away would be the electron, which would be about the size of a grain of sand. 
And that thing is just whipping around the nucleus so fast that it feels solid, even though there's a tremendous amount of gap. It's just power. It's just electricity. Think about that. God is controlling all of these things. It feels solid, almost as, as if you were to take your hand up to a fan that's whipping around. And you, you put it up there, you can almost think it's, it's solid. Now, you don't want to stick your finger in the fan because you'll, you'll hurt yourself. But if you stop the fan, you'd realize that it's just, there's a lot of gap in between the fan blades. Well, that's, that's what it's like with these electrons just whipping around. It's power. God's tremendous power. Now, one day God's just going to go, and he's just going to let it go. He's going to release it. And it's going to cause this nuclear fission all over with every created thing, every material thing. When I think about God's power, I just kind of dwell on it. I think, wow, God, you created all of that. Now, that's just the small things that we, we can't see with the naked eye. But then you look up at the stars, you look up at the sun, you think, man, that's tremendous power. And you know, our sun, the earth can fit into the sun 1.3 million times, but the sun can fit into um, Betelgeuse millions of times over. And you think, what kind of being has that kind of power to produce these things? And then you go, wow, if you've got that kind of power, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You, I mean, why us? Why, why me? Why do you care? <laughs> and then you start thinking, if God has that kind of power and he is my father, then what do I have to worry about? Let me ask you this. What, what kind of problem are you facing right now? Well, a God who can hold the universe in the palm of his hand, he's got all that power and he cares and loves you. There's nothing that God can't do. There's no problem that you face that God can't handle. What fear? You know, what do you need? Is there anything that you need, whether it's financial or emotional or whatever it may be? God has power. And he's going to take care of every need and everything that faces you. And, and all he wants you to do is just believe it, just to trust him. Notice what it says here. He says, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Now, if you've ever seen uh, a video of a nuclear explosion, you just know this, it's an incredible loud noise. Um, a couple years ago, in July of 2018, in Carr, California, there was a, what they called a fire tornado that happened. So the, there were cold winds that were coming in off the Pacific over a mountain range that then went down the other side of the mountain range. There was a, a little wildfire that had started there. And then these cold winds sort of whipped up the fire. And there was a fire tornado that started that the winds of it were 143 miles an hour. And it, it, the temperatures got up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. And the height of this tornado was 17,000 feet. It was higher than the highest mountain in the state of California. It was just burning everything around it to a crisp. You couldn't even get within, um, uh, I think it was 600 yards, maybe even farther away, without dying because the, the oxygen would just be pulled right out of you. It was incredible. Great noise of, of fire. And you think about the, what God's going to do when he just releases the elements. There's just going to be this incredible noise. And then it says, and the, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The earth, of course, we're talking about the elements, but then it says, and the works that are in it. Now that could be, you know, buildings, etc. But I think it's deeper than that. The works are the works that we do apart from God. The works of man are going to be completely burned up. And I'm going to ask you again, what about you? Will everything you've worked for be destroyed? Or are you storing up treasure in heaven? When you die, are you going to leave your treasure? Or are you going to go to your treasure? William MacDonald said it like this. Everything material has the stamp of oblivion upon it. 
The things of which men boast, the things for which they live, are passing things at best. To live for material things is to live for the temporary. Common sense tells us to turn from the tinsel and toys of this world and to live in holiness and godliness. It is a simple matter of living for eternity rather than time, of emphasizing the spiritual rather than material, of choosing the permanent over the passing. I think we need to really look at this verse that that Peter is, is telling us. Everything material is going to burn. One of the things that that I want you to think about throughout this week, should the Lord tarry, is those material things that you look at as you're just walking around, buildings, birds, trees, stars, etc. Behind all of those material things is God. All the material world, we think, oh, that's the permanent thing. No, that's the temporary thing. God is the permanent thing. God and the works that we do for him are the permanent things. Don't get caught up in the material world. It's so easy to do. But God has opened our eyes to see something beyond this material world. See, unbelievers are trapped in it. They can't see beyond it. But God says, no, I want you to see me. I want you to see the word of God. I want you to see angels. I want you to see beyond this physical realm into the spiritual realm. And those things are going to be um, eternal. Verse 11 Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? He's saying, since that's going to happen, since it's all going to burn up, how should you live? What manner of persons ought you to be? And notice, in holy conduct, that is, living for God. Living your life for God. So you're getting your Bible out and you're saying, God, I want to know you, I want to know what you're like, and I want to know how you want me to live. So if you're just a new Christian here today, the best way that you can grow in your walk is read the Bible, believe it, and then do what it says. And guess what? You will just grow and grow and grow and grow. You will be living for God. But not just living for God, it says, and godliness. And that means being like God, becoming like him. And the more that you live for God, the more that you become like God. You become like the one you're focused on. You'll just naturally be drawn in that direction. Looking for, verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Looking for. The Bible tells us in Titus 3.12 that we're to look for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be looking for that. And he says, and hastening the coming of the day of God. Now, this is interesting. Hastening meaning hurrying it up. Now, how can we down here in these bodies hurry up or hasten This coming of the day of God. Well, it's by getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the world. This is what Jesus said about it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a witness, in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So as we get in the business of getting the gospel out, as we begin um, fulfilling the Great Commission, We can hasten the coming of the day of God. We can bring it on. Verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, what was his promise? Do you remember back in the first nine verses of this chapter, he was talking about the promises of God and how he was going to come back. Well, he's talking about the promise of the new heavens and the new earth. Well, we see this back in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And here Peter picks up on that and he applies it to the eternal state. This eternal state where 
we're going to be in this place of eternal bliss forever and ever and ever. Now, I want you to look with me right to the end of the book. Go to Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to read some verses about this because it's important for us to keep our, our minds fixed on what's coming. Revelation 21 verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I love this. I love this. I, I like to read the end of the book quite often, just to keep my mind fixed on what's coming. Because, you know, sometimes down here we can get um, just put off by a lot of the things that we see. We can get worried, discouraged. And it's important to know what is coming. It's important to know that Jesus wins and that we're on the winning side because we're saved. Now, did you notice something? It says, um, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, the, the heavens in the Bible, there talks about three heavens. You got the first heaven, which is our atmosphere, the trophosphere. You've got the second heavens, which would be you know, the stellar heavens, you know, space. And then you've got the third heaven, and that's the place where God lives. Now, clearly, the third heaven is not going to be destroyed. Because you see the, the new Jerusalem coming down out of the third heaven from God. But the first and second heavens, the, the created heavens, they are going to be destroyed and recreated. So I love this because... When we are put in this eternal state, in the new Jerusalem, in, in uh, the new heavens and the new earth, there's going to be no more curse. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, he cursed the creation. There was a curse put on it by God. Now, during the, the millennial kingdom, there's going to be a reversing of that curse. The lion is going to lie down with the lamb, uh, you know, the, the, a child will play in a, in a viper's den, etc., but it's still going to be there because people are going to die during the millennial kingdom. And people are actually going to be born during the millennial kingdom as well. But in the eternal state, that's not going to be happening. Nobody will die. So in verse, in verse 4, he says he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Eternal bliss. Can you... I don't think we can, we can hardly imagine this. No more crying? Man, we live in a, in a sorrowful world. We, the, 20, what is it, the 21st century is basically an upholstered sewer. People laugh and stuff, but you know, there's just death all around us. People die. It's sad. I mean, of course, there are times of, of rejoicing, etc., but you just think about it. Nobody gets out of here alive. It's sad, but there's going to come a day the eternal state, when there's going to be no more crying, no more death or sorrow. And I just am so looking forward to that. Man brought death to this earth, but God will restore life. Man is going to be in right relationship with God forever. Eternal bliss, eternal happiness. Do you know this has been God's desire ever since he created the universe in Genesis 1.1? He's wanted to be with man. He's wanted to be in a right relationship with man. Think about it. God was fully self-satisfied, fully self-contained within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They didn't need us, but they created us to have a relationship with them. And it's been God's desire ever since he created man to have this, this kind of relationship. So he gets it in the end in, in Revelation 21. The heaven and the earth are not God's greatest creation. We are. And so he's going to put redeemed man in a recreated heavens and earth to live with him 
forever. He's going to get his desire. His will will be done. Now back in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, look in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Now, he wants us to actively, as we think about these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, meaning regarding one another in, in the body of Christ and in our relationships with other people. As, as much as depends on us, we're to live peaceably with all men, Paul says in Romans 12. He, wants, he, sh- he says we should be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And so that means we're not to be involved in sin. We're not to say, oh yeah, it's just a little sin. No, we're to turn and repent from sin. We're to live holy lives. Paul says this in Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. That's exactly what Peter is saying here. Be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So he says. The long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Consider that. Why is God waiting? God is waiting to come back to judge this earth because he wants people to get saved. And I'm sure glad he has. Because I said last week, if he came 26 years ago, I'd be in hell. But he's come and he's saved. And he is waiting to save people all around us. Don't give up on them. Keep praying for them. But I want you to notice something. He says... As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Now, this is really, um, this is really sweet of what Peter writes here. Because Peter here is practicing what he has just preached to us. Be found in peace. Now, you remember in Galatians chapter 2, Paul said that when he came to Antioch, he rebuked Peter publicly in front of other Christians. Because for a while, Peter in Antioch was eating with Gentiles, being a Jewish uh, believer in Jesus Christ. He said, well, I can eat with Gentiles. But when people came down from Jerusalem from James, he withdrew from the Gentiles and wouldn't eat with them. Now, this is interesting because Paul gets up and he says, if you being a Jew can't keep the law, why are you putting the law on these Gentiles? Don't you know that we're all one in Christ Jesus, in other words? And so now he says, our beloved brother, Paul, he's being found in peace. He's, in other words, he's saying, I, you know, I forgive him. <laughs> I don't hold it against him for what he, he did to me. I, I took it on board. He says, as also our beloved brother, Paul, according to the wisdom of God given to him, has written to you. Now, this may mean that the book of Hebrews was actually written by the Apostle Paul. Because you remember, the people that that Peter's writing to are people from a Jewish background who've become Christians. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians. So it could be a reference to that, or it could just mean that his books of Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, which were written to Gentile believers in Asia Minor, were actually also read by those who um, were from a Jewish background. Verse 16 says, and also in all his epistles, speaking in them 
of these things in which are some things hard to understand. (laughs) Now, if you read through Paul's letters, you know that you better put your thinking caps on because some of the things that he says in there are difficult to grasp. They're very deep theological issues. So you can't just read it on the surface. You've got to think through it. You've got to pray through it. And and God, by his spirit, will give you insight into these things. But notice what he says. Which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So untaught and unstable people twist Paul's writings, but also the writings of the rest of the scriptures. Now, you remember that Paul is the apostle of grace. That's what he's known for, the grace of God. Here was this Jewish guy who was all full of legalism. God touched his heart by the grace of God, and so every aspect of his life was touched by grace. So in all his writings, he's just really steeped in grace. These people twist the grace of God in two ways, through legalism. Now, you can destroy the grace of God by saying, yeah, Jesus died for our sins, but I've also got to do something else to please God. So it's Jesus and fill in the blank. That's destroying God's grace by legalism. It's not Jesus and, Jesus plus. It's Jesus alone and we're saved. Isn't that good news? Because any one of us can do that. Any one of us can believe. But once you start adding things to that, you're into legalism. Second way that they destroy it and twist it is through license. So they say, yes, Jesus died for all of our sins, grace of God. That means that we can do whatever we want to do. We can go out and sin all we want, and we're still in in a right relationship with God. And that's just not true. The Bible tells us in Titus that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. I mentioned a few weeks ago about Bishop Shelby Spong, um, who was the... uh, Anglican or Episcopal Bishop of Newark, New Jersey. The New York Times wrote an article about him several years ago, and and we'll read this to you. Quote, seeing St. Paul as a homosexual has helped him understand the apostles' anguished cries. O wretched man that I am, his apparent hostility toward women, wives submit to your husbands, and the fact that he never married. He says, quote, Nothing else, in my opinion, could account for Paul's self-judging rhetoric, his negative feeling toward his own body, and his sense of being controlled by something he had no power to change. So Bishop Shelby Spong twists Paul's words to say that Paul was a frustrated homosexual. And that's just not true. Paul himself was clearly um, a, uh, a believing Jew, he wasn't a homosexual, and he was probably married because he was a Pharisee, and you couldn't be a Pharisee without being married. When he became a Christian, she probably left him. So uh, that's just scripture twisting to the extreme. But notice in, in the end, he says, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Peter puts Paul's writings right up there on par with the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures that had already been written. So this is where we're going to stop today. We'll pick up the last two verses next week. But brothers and sisters, as we close today, I just want you to think about the things that we've been reading here with regard to the material world being completely destroyed. God's going to burn it up. And so what, what are you working for? Are you working for things that are temporary? Or are you working for things that are going to last, that are, going, that are eternal? Now, you can make something very basic into something eternal. You can make changing a nappy into an eternal work. You might think, how does that happen? Well, if you're doing that for God, you're loving that little child, you're loving your spouse, you say, I'll change that stinky nappy. You can make that one disgusting act an eternal act. You can make washing the dishes an eternal act. I'm doing this for God. Praise the Lord. I'm doing it because I love my family and I'm going to clear it up. Or I'm just, Lord, I'm I'm serving for you. I'm doing all this for you. And God says, I'm going to put that on your account for eternal things. Treasures in heaven. Where you spend your money. You know, and that, that can include, you know, 
buying things for your children, clothing or, or whatever, food. All of these things can be acts that are eternal. It can be in the matter of getting the gospel out, getting your money working for gospel promotion. That's storing up treasure in heaven. But think about this. The material world is going to burn, but God is behind all of that, and he's going to be forever. God is all you need. It's been said, when you find that God is all you have, you'll realize that God is all you need. He loves you. He's going to take care of you. Are you seeking him? Are you passionately seeking the one who loves you more than anyone else? Are you drawing near to him in Bible study, in prayer, coming to church? Are you serving him with all your heart? Or have these material things got you? Have they gripped you? Are you living for the material world? uh, Peter would say, don't do that. Turn to the Lord. Serve him with all your heart. And for you who are listening who are not yet Christians, my friends, and maybe online, how are you going to do on that day of judgment when you stand before God and he sees you with those eyes of fire? How are you going to do on that day? You might say to me, well, I'm a good person. I'm going to be fine. Well, let me put that to the test. Put it to the test. Are you really a good, good person? Are you really good enough to go to heaven? Or are you just like me? You're a sinner saved by grace. Let me put it to the test. You just read the Ten Commandments. The Ninth Commandment says you shall not lie. The Eighth Commandment says you shall not steal. Seventh Commandment says you shall not commit adultery. Jesus said if you've looked with lust, you've done that. Sixth Commandment says you shall not murder. Jesus said if you've had hatred in your heart, you committed murder. Fifth commandment says you shall honor your father and mother. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Third commandment says you don't take God's name in vain. Have you ever done that? Use God's name as a curse word. If you've broken any one of those, you are like me. You're a sinner. Join the crowd. And the problem is that we're going to die and we're going to be judged. And if we're judged in our sin, we're going to be sent to hell. But God loves us and he's come to this earth to die for our sins. And when he was on the cross, he died for our sins to pay the penalty for them. And he rose again the third day. And if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. By simple faith, not by doing good things, but because Jesus did all the work for us on the cross and by the empty tomb, by rising from the dead, we can be saved. So I want to encourage you right now to take your faith and to place it in Jesus. And Jesus will save you. Just trust him with your salvation. Just pray this simple prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner and I turn from my sins and I put my trust in you and what you did for me on the cross to save me from my sins. Come into my life and help me live for you. Deliver me from this material world that's going to burn and help me live for you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand with me? Well, may God bless you this week and just fill you afresh with his spirit and give you joy unspeakable and full of glory and open the doors for you to tell other people this good news about Jesus to hasten the coming of the day of God. So God bless you, and don't feel like you've got to run off. If you want a fellowship, please do. But uh, may the Lord just bless you and keep you this week. Amen.